So I'm going to walk you guys through how to uh, take advantage of a few things with Fusion 360, uh, Adobe Illustrator, and then uh, using a CNC router like the X-Carve to make this uh, little toy rocket here with uh, the name engraved on it. So we're going to basically um, walk through using Fusion 360 to model something like this, import this kind of fancy text from something like Adobe Illustrator, and then ultimately set up all of the cam tool paths to cut this thing out. So let's uh, take a step back and get started. So this model was created uh, already in Fusion, and this is the model I'm going to want to bring in some artwork onto. So you can see, you know, this model was, uh, is really simple. It's just uh, a single sketch. We can look at the sketch. It's basically just uh, some a few splines and a couple of lines. So it's a spline, line, another spline, fillet, line, some symmetry. Um, you see one thing that I did here is I actually kind of in advance I um, made a box that's going to represent the same size space that I would use as an artboard in Illustrator. This is one thing that will make things uh, really easy for you is uh, Illustrator Note always keeps the upper left hand corner as zero. So notice I've modeled this thing relative to that. So I have the upper left hand corner as my uh, origin. And then I've drawn in kind of a box to represent, uh, you know, an eight by 10 rectangle. And then this is the same uh, size canvas or artboard or whatever it's called in Adobe Illustrator that I'm going to use. So I could even actually bring this sketch into Illustrator and open it up and then bring it back uh, with the new artwork into, into Fusion 360. So basically I created that sketch and then just uh, extruded it. So you can see here, it's just a simple extrude. And note I extruded it down, that again, that makes things easier. So I extruded it down from the XY plane. And the depth that I did here, this minus seven seven, this again is the uh, exact value that I measured um, from the piece of stock that I'm gonna be cutting this out of. So I've already measured the material that I'm gonna cut this out of, it's 0.77 inches. So I've extruded the first uh, shape down by 0.77. And now let's go take a look at how we get something like this uh, out of Illustrator. So if you wanna be really slick, what you can do is you can take, now you can take that sketch and you can say save as DXF. So I'm gonna save that as DXF and I'll save it out onto my desktop. And now what you can do is bring that into Illustrator. So in Adobe Illustrator, I can say File, Open, and I can open up that new Rocket DXF file. And I want to say that one unit equals one inches. That's important. And now I've got that Rocket here. And now I just have to go in and uh, I can edit the artboards. So we can say I want to edit the artboard and you can kind of snap this here. And so kind of the tricky thing about this is um, now I know I have like the reference of my Fusion sketch here. So now what I could do is I can type in some text for the like a name or something that I want to do. So in this case, what I want to do is I kind of just want to put my son's name on here. So we'll go ahead and do this. I can make it bigger. I can change the font. We'll do like this uh, Mistral. And then we can um, rotate it up. And then now, now you can just kind of scale it around to make sure it's just sort of what you wanted. Um, here like this maybe. And maybe we'll scale it up a little bit. That's the nice thing about working with stuff like text and illustrators. You can get a, like a much better uh, control over it. And then if you want, you could um, you could even say you want to make a new layer and put the text onto that. 
and then hide this or even really delete it because you aren't going to need that anymore but you can keep it around for reference but when you go to export it sometimes it's easier to just go ahead and delete that uh, reference and then we're going to select the text and since we're going to bring this into Fusion 360 what we need is we need to have this be paths so we need to have this as vectors so I'm going to go ahead and create outlines so by creating outlines what that's going to do is it's going to give me essentially like a spline in Fusion 360 uh, that I can then use to create geometry with and now we're going to say file save as and we'll save it as an SVG. We'll call this new rocket. Take the defaults here, say OK. And now, when I go back into Fusion, I can say I want to insert an SVG file. So we're going to insert this new rocket. And then for the plane, we want to select the top plane. And then finally, we want to set the scale here. So even Illustrator just thinks of everything in pixels when it's exporting an SVG. So the default in Illustrator is 72 pixels per inch. So when we're importing an SVG, you want to set the scale to be 1 over 72. And then everything should come in and be aligned just nicely. And now you'll see the text from the Illustrator file is imported right where we expected it to be on the rocket, which makes everything a lot easier. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to cut those letters out just so we can see it better. It actually makes it easier to work with in CAM too, even though really all we're going to need is the profile. But what we'll do is we'll say extrude. So again, under create, extrude. And then now we're going to select the profile. So you just want to kind of move your mouse around and make sure you get it just in the right spot. You'll see the preview highlight of the uh, inside of the letters when you have the right area selected. So we'll select all those. Then you can drag this down or you can type in a value. Make it down a quarter inch. And again, we want to make sure that the operation is set to cut, distance, no taper, and we're good. So now we've got our Okay, so now we're going to switch over to the CAM workspace. So we'll change workspaces here, select CAM. And the first thing we need to do is create a setup. So you can think of a setup as basically, you know, it's maybe it's different setups if you're going to do two-sided machining or something like that. But when it comes to these kind of machines, uh, I also like to do one setup for every tool. It makes it easier to sort of organize all the operations that are going to be for each tool into a folder, essentially. And then it makes it easier to keep track of it when I'm going to go post-process it later. So we'll go ahead and say um, new setup, and this is going to be milling. Um, we'll select the model so we can just pick this. It's not really necessary, but I like to do it anyways. Um, and then we might want to say that in this case, I want to change the Y and X orientations uh, just based on the way this is going to lay out on my machine. So if you pick the front of an arrow, it just switches the direction. See that? But if you pick the back of the arrow, so if I pick the back of the arrow, I can then pick something to align it to. So now I've got my Y axis aligned to that edge, and then I'll pick the tip again to set the direction. So now I've got this thing kind of oriented the way that I want with X running this way, Y running that way, Z facing up. So depending on how you did your modeling when you oriented it, you very often will have to change this around. If you want to, you can select on that center point and you can move uh, your zero. So if, if, for example, you wanted to zero off the lower left, which a lot of people like to do, uh, you could do that here. In this case, um, just because of the way I'm going to lay this out on the machine, I think it's going to be easier for me to just leave this right in the center. And if you're going to just profile something out of like piece of stock, you don't really have to be super accurate about measuring the stock. If you just go off the center, you just know that you know, your shape that you're going to cut out is going to be kind of centered right there. And wherever you set your machine zero later is going to be the center of the thing you're about to cut out. So it's kind of like a quick and easy way to do it. Um, so I'm happy with that orientation. I selected my model and I'll just set my stock size. Um, so you can say relative size. So in this case, I could just say relative size and then just cut it out. And it doesn't really matter what size my stock is. But just for consistency, I will do it. I have measured my stock. Um, so I happen to know that it is the piece that I'm going to be cutting out of is 
about this big. And But this is what's important here, especially since I'm zeroing off the top. I'm going to want to have like a pretty accurate uh, depth uh, measurement. Uh, usually I would, sometimes I often I zero off the bed of the machine, but in this case, just because I'm going to do the engraving, uh, I decided to zero off the top of the workpiece. You know, it just depends on the situation, but as long as you make a pretty accurate measurement of the thickness, then you should be pretty good to go. So I measured it to be, uh, at the thickest point that I measured was 0.77. So again, this piece of wood that I'm cutting isn't perfectly flat. It varied by about 10, 15 thousandths around, but I just putting in the biggest so that I know for sure I'll be cutting through all the way around. Probably scuff up the wasteboard a little bit, but it doesn't really matter. So there we go. That's gonna be my stock size. So again, the height is the most important thing here. And now I've got that set up. If I want, I can rename this. So I know this is going to be my uh, eighth inch uh, flat end mill. And now we'll create some uh, the actual operations to cut this thing out. OK, so now I'm going to set up the first tool path, which is going to be with this uh, eighth inch flat cutter. So we're going to do a 2D contour. And the contour that we want to cut out is the bottom. And We'll set select a tool, so we're going to select a uh, one eighth inch uh, flat end mill. Uh, you can pick whichever one. Ultimately, it really just matters about the, uh, the the diameter here, unless we were getting really specific with depths and whatnot. Um, but we'll select that. We can give it uh, the speed. So here, twelve thousand and sixty. That looks good. That's what I want. Um, we've picked the contour. The next thing we want to do is we're going to turn on tabs. So we'll give the tab width of maybe. Uh, quarter inch and a height of say uh, 0.1 and we're going to do triangular. So what this is going to do is it's going to leave kind of one tab or it's going to leave these tabs all the way around as it's cutting out and that way uh, once it's done profiling this thing the piece isn't going to go flying out and I'm making these tabs kind of big on purpose just because uh, I'm going to come back in and do the engraving and chamfer after I've done the profile. So I want to make sure it's still nice and strong in there. Uh, don't really have to change anything on the heights. Under passes, we want to set um, we want to set multiple depths. So we don't want to try to take this in one pass. We'll take a step down of say uh, 60 thousandths. Uh, good rule of thumb I hear is uh, about half the cutter diameter. So I'll go uh, 60 thousandths step. And the other big deal that you want to change here is uh, you don't want to do climb milling. Uh, climb milling is like if you think about trying to push a piece of wood through a table saw backwards. That's basically what you're doing with climb milling. Very common in like very rigid uh, metal CNC, but obviously for uh, our purposes here, we want to do um, conventional. So right, conventional, that's very important to change that. And then everything else, um, you can play around with these settings, but this is basically uh, all you need to do um, here. And then uh, this is all good as well. And we'll go ahead and select OK. And we can see a preview of the toolpath. So we can see it's basically going to just go and step and step and step down. And then it's going to do this nice little thing for the, at the end for us to make these tabs. OK, so now we want to use the uh, set up the engraving to do the lettering, and then we'll also run a little chamfer around the uh, upper edge. So what I want to do is I want to create another setup. Um, to do that, I could either create a new setup by coming in here, saying setup, new setup, and then applying all the same parameters. Or another nice trick is to just select the one that you already did, press Control C, select operations, press Control V, or Command C, Command V on Mac, and then you can come in here, delete the other operation, and then we'll rename this. So we're going to do a one half uh, chamfer bit here. So again, I like to name my setups, what tool I'm going to use in it. It just makes it easier to keep track of it when you're going to post it later for these machines with no tool changers or anything like that. So uh, once you've created the new setup, the next thing you need to do is you want to activate it. So that means that when we start creating more tool paths, it's going to go into this folder. Um, and the first one we're going to do is under 2D engrave. And we'll select our tool. So here we're going to pick um, a uh, one half inch chamfer mill. Notice on the chamfer mill, um, if you have to, if you end up needing to create one of these from scratch, you want to set the tip diameter to be 0.001 inch, or if it's 
bigger than that for some reason. But don't set this to be zero. So if, when you're setting up the tool, you don't want to go to uh, zero. Just a little side note. So we'll pick our half inch chamfer mill. You can set up the speeds if this uh, already is set up the way I want. So spindle speed of 12,000, uh, feed rates of 40 inches per minute. That looks good. Then for geometry, now what I need to do is I need to select the contours that I want to cut out. So you just want to kind of roll your mouse over and make sure that the thing that you want to be selected is being selected. And you just want to pick all of these upper contours of the letters. And note, like for the A, I have to pick the outer and the inner. So now I've got all the contours I want selected. And then under heights, for the bottom height, what you want to do here is you want to set what's the maximum depth that you're willing to have it go to. In this case, I'll say a quarter inch, but that's really going to be determined by uh, the width of these letters and how deep the bit is able to go because it's basically going to be figuring out the widths of these cuts based on the depth of the, um, of the chamfer bit. So it's going to kind of raise and lower the bit depending on how wide of a cut it needs to be. But you want to set here is basically essentially what your maximum depth that you're willing to go to is. Uh, and then here and here, these are all fine. We'll leave that. And now you can get a preview of what the toolpath looks like. So if you look at that, you can kind of see what it's going to do. It's kind of crazy. It just will come in and it's going to go along this one path, uh, but taking a couple other little side steps to basically uh, fill out the width of this top profile, but by using that variable depth. Okay, as long as we've got the uh, chamfer bit on there, I'm just going to go ahead and add a 2D chamfer toolpath. So we'll pick 2D chamfer. Our chamfer bit is already selected. Set the speeds and feeds, which we'll use the same here. Uh, for the geometry, we just want to pick this top contour. So we're just going to have a nice little chamfer run all the way around the top of the outside. Don't need to change anything here. And then this is where we can set the width and the offset. Um, so in this case, I'm going to just do uh, 50 thousandths. And we'll make sure that we have at least a 50 thousandths clearance if it was to run into any obstacles or any edge that we didn't want chamfered or something like that. And nothing else we really need to change here. Hit OK. And so now that we've got our final toolpath done, We'll go ahead and select the entire uh, set of operations and we can simulate it. And this is kind of nice just to see uh, you know, everything that's going to happen. So we can, we can go ahead and play this and you can watch what's going to happen um, as the operations go through one by one. If you want, you can skip ahead to the next operation. So now we can watch the engraving, how it's going to cut the letters out, and then how it's going to come in and cut our nice little chamfer out. And sometimes it's nice to run that and just sort of take a look at this um, from the top. And we can see the tabs um, and what this is going to look like once it's done. So from there, now it's just a matter of uh, post-processing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select our first set of operations. And I can right-click, say post-process. One very important note here is, so we're going to select Gerbil. So you come in here, you're going to want to select Gerbil if you're using the XCarve or whatever post-processor for whatever machine you're using. Uh, in this case, if you're not familiar with the term G28, and if you're not uh, using G28, if you don't home your machine or anything like that, and you want to disable that, you want to come in here and disable this Use G28. Um, if you're not familiar with what it is, I would just recommend not using it. So we'll say OK. And then we'll go ahead and just post-process this out onto the desktop or wherever you want to put it. And we'll call this, I like to name it the name of the tool I'm going to use. So we'll call this uh, uh, rocket underscore one eighth flat dot NC. And then we'll do the same thing for the other one. So we'll post-process the chamfer. Again, selecting the Gerbil post, and we're going to turn off G28. And we'll call this one rocket underscore one half chamfer dot C. And that's it. We're all done. We're ready to go run it.
Okay, to set this up, I'm going to use a couple of pieces of double-sided tape uh, and the clamps. So first, we'll just pull this off. Okay, and then we're going to use these clamps. All right, I'm going to mark the center of this real quick. Use my daughter's ruler here. Just got to kind of eyeball it. Doesn't really matter. I just need a consistent spot in case I need to refine zero later. Okay, and that's going to be my zero. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do when I open up Universal G Code Sender, so launch Universal G Code Sender. And then I'm going to open the connection. So the machine is on. And we're ready to go ahead. And the first step I'm going to do is going to be to home the machine. So if you don't have limit switches, uh, you know, this is an unnecessary step, obviously. But um, I have them, so I'm going to use them. Okay, so now the machine is homed. I'm going to I'm going to jog the machine to my zero position. So you can set a value here and then jog the machine to where you want the zero to be. What I usually do is just get it close and then And then we'll go in a more fine step. Okay. And that looks good. Okay, so I'm happy with my uh, zero. So I'm going to go ahead and reset the X and Y axis. And then we'll set the Z. We're going to do it off the top of the material on, for this one. And at this point, we're really ready to go. Um, we'll go over, we'll go ahead and grab the file. Sometimes another nice thing to do is to just move this thing up a little bit in case there's a jog at the beginning of your file. So I'm going to go browse to that, grab the rocket, and we're going to get the first file, which is the for the 8th inch flat end mill. Go ahead and open that up, and uh, you'll see I have the 8th inch flat end mill loaded in the machine. And uh, that's really it. Um, that's all you have to do to be ready to uh, run this thing. So we'll go ahead and hit send. Okay, so at this point, our zeros are all still good, so we don't want to change, especially not the X and Y zero, but we can still jog this around. So let's go ahead and jog the machine over. We can reset this. Move the machine over back more towards the middle so we're in a similar place. Okay, we can even go uh, up a little bit to make this easier. Now what we're going to do is we're going to change the tool. So we've got chamfer bit already loaded in its own collet, which makes things just a little easier. So we'll go ahead and change this. So I like having one collet for every tool, That's, or at least for every size, because the uh, 
these eighth inch cutters are obviously eighth inch shank and then this chamfer tool is a quarter inch so if you're going to buy the quarter inch collet make sure you buy an extra nut too it just makes everything easier okay So now that we've got that loaded on, now all we have to do is we just have to reset the zero. So I'm going to just jog this down. So I'm just touching. And now I want to reset the Z axis, making very sure not to mess with the X and Y. And then again, let's just uh, bring it up a little bit, just in case that first jog. Now we'll go ahead and browse and get our chamfer G code. We'll open that up. And at this point, again, we're ready to run. So we'll just go ahead and send it. And there we go. Chamfer is done. And with that, we are done. I can just take this thing and just kind of cut these tabs out. Just use a knife. There we go. So now I just take some sandpaper or a little hand router and finish those off. But uh, other than that, looks pretty good and there it is all done